Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to, to today's Senate lecture. Uh, my name is Tim Bryant. I'm the Director of Research in the Department of the Senate, and we organise these lectures. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge and show my respect to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be present. 50 years ago tomorrow, Australians went to the polls to vote on proposed constitutional amendments in the manner stipulated by section 128 of the Constitution. And because this is a Senate lecture, it's always important to remind people about going back to the Constitution. There were two questions. The first was the often forgotten nexus question, which asked Australians to consider changing section 24 of the Australian Constitution which holds that the number of members in the House of Representatives shall be, as nearly as practicable, twice the number of senators. Dennis Strangman's paper, which I see many of you have picked up on the way in, looks at this question in some detail. Dennis will make some brief comments at the end of Russell Taylor's lecture. The second question, which is the focus of our lecture today, proposed two amendments to the Constitution so as to include, oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Could you hear the first five minutes of that brilliant oration? <laughs> well, let me just recap a little bit. Um, <laughs> what I said was that 50 years ago tomorrow, Australians went to the polls. There were two questions. The first was the often forgotten nexus question which asked Australians to consider changing section 24 of the Australian Constitution. Dennis Strangman's paper uh, looks at this question in some detail and Dennis will make some brief comments at the end of the lecture. The second question, which is the focus of our lecture today, proposed two amendments to the Constitution so as to include Aboriginal people in the census and to allow the Commonwealth to create laws for them. Russell Taylor will take us through the implications of that vote in 1967 for Indigenous constitutional recognition today. Russell Taylor is an Aboriginal Australian with extensive experience as an executive in the Australian Public Service. He recently completed an eight year period as Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, during which time he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia. Please join me join me in welcoming Russell Taylor. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends and family, thank you all for coming and attending the lecture this afternoon. I'd like to express my appreciation of being invited and afforded the opportunity to present this occasional lecture in this special place at this special time. Many thanks to Tim Bryant, Director of Research, and also to Filia Antonini, Program Coordinator from the Australian Senate. Also, could I just express some appreciation to my colleague, Peter Huguenay, uh, RAN, Captain RAN retired for his support and suggestions for improvements in my paper. Also, of course, as a Kamilroy man, and in our language, Kadai Bulbati, the language of my father, can I say to you, Yama Ninda, Yamagara Nindayu. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello to everyone. Gulbiai Bawa, Gulbiai Daga. Welcome, sisters, welcome, brothers. Darwin Naya Wenengalaya. I wish to formally recognise and acknowledge country. Yurundi Nanga Galinja, Gunida Nanga Galinja. Yai Wanga Nanabu Nambri Nalai. Under the bitumen of this great building, there is always the land of the Nanabu and the Nambri peoples. I pay respects to their elders past and present, pay tribute to their resilience and continued cultural practices on country. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to the other elders and leaders, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous here, here this afternoon. And I'd also like to dedicate this lecture 
to all those people, those heroes, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who campaigned in support of the successful 1967 referendum. We owe them a great debt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I prepared quite a lengthy paper in preparation of this lecture. I'm not going to burden you with that. It would take too long. We would be here all day. But I hope that you will have access to that paper um, in the totality of some of my thoughts. So I am going to draw from extracts of the paper in terms of, for the purpose of the lecture this afternoon. So this week, as Tim's already alluded, marks the 50th anniversary of an extraordinary event in the history of Australia. And I feel very privileged about being able to share my perceptions about the nature and the impact of this event. Of course, we're talking about the successful 1967 referendum in which an overwhelming majority of Australians have voted to amend certain clauses in the Australian Constitution concerning Aboriginal people. Essentially, changes to these clauses allowed for Aboriginal peoples to be included in the census and altered the race power to allow federal parliament to make special laws about Aboriginal peoples. Uh, I should acknowledge that I'm neither a lawyer, and although I have great respect for history, I'm not a trained historian. And also, thirdly, my comments are my own personal perceptions as an individual Indigenous Australian and do not represent the Indigenous position on the issues that we're going to talk about this afternoon. In my paper, I try to provide some historical context. And in the interest of brevity, can I just say that the 1960s was certainly an era of protest, both domestically and internationally. And uh, one of the powerful influences, of course, at that time was the civil rights movement in the United States, which certainly reflected and had influence in terms of Indigenous aspirations in this country. According to my writing instructions from Tim, my lecture today includes three components of my personal perspectives. Firstly, a short commentary about the history and the nature of challenges and demands and the campaign for the Constitution amendments in 1967. Secondly, my personal recollection and perspective on the impact of that referendum. And thirdly, my perspective on aspects of the significant challenges associated with Indigenous constitutional recognition today. So in terms of the 1967 referendum, as Tim said, to set the historical and factual context, the 1967 referendum posed two questions. The first question for consideration referred to then and, and now and historically as the nexus question represented an attempt to alter the balance of numbers of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, my research is only cursory. I do not cover this particular issue in my lecture. Um, and I'll leave the commentary to experts such as my colleague Dennis Strangman, who's here today. And Dennis will provide some perspective about that. Suffice it to state that the, that the history shows that the next question was not supported, having only achieved a majority in one state and a national yes vote of around 40%. Um, however, the focus of my comments today, of course, involved the second question, which was to determine whether two references in the Australian Constitution which discriminated against Aboriginal people should be removed. And very briefly, although I cover this in much more detail in my paper, the questions involved, the, the amendments involved, an amendment to section 51 and complete removal of section 127. Um, it's probably unnecessary for me to say that the campaign was indeed, indeed successful and spectacularly so in that the 67 referendum saw the highest yes vote ever recorded in a federal referendum with an unprecedented 90.77% vote for change. 
and until that time, only four of 24 referendum had previously been successful. And I make the point that politically, there was a bipartisan approach to this referendum and there was a complete absence of any no case formulated or publicly articulated. And I'll make some comment about this later in the lecture. So, uh, some comments and perceptions about the campaign for reform that led up to the 67 referendum. Um, since Federation, the demands in the formal campaign for constitutional reform in Aboriginal affairs leading to the successful 67 referendum had endured a long, complex, tortuous and to say the least, frustrating history. My paper provides a succinct summary of those events from 1901 to 1960s. In the interest of brevity, I'll simply say that there were many, many calls for constitutional amendment in the context of Aboriginal affairs from Federation onwards. And it's clear that universally, the demands for constitutional change were essentially about the Commonwealth Government assuming control for Aboriginal affairs and therefore wresting control from the states. And as I said, my paper includes the details of that history and a significant event in that history involved in 1958, um, the establishment of the Federal Council for Aboriginal Advancement, later of course, named as the Federal Council for Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, the CATSI. Further, in 1962, this organisation, at its annual conference, formally proposed to undertake a national campaign, which ultimately became the successful coordinated campaign supporting the 67 referendum. And for CATSI, from 62 onwards, leading up to the 67, successful 67 referendum, prosecuted a strategy known as the Petitions Campaign, which sought to first and foremost highlight to the public at large the legal discrimination faced by Aboriginal people as fundamental evidence to support constitutional change. Remarkably, through its efforts, the National Campaign collected some 103,000 signatures in 94 separate petitions and ultimately led to the securing of parliamentary support and of course on the 26th of May 1967 the referendum was conducted with a yes vote carrying the day and as I've said to an overwhelming vote. I want to make some critique about the campaign and as I say in the interest of brevity um, I make the comment on paper that was some either deliberate or misguided rep, uh, misrepresentation of some of the issues in the campaign. And in making this comment, I essentially focus on the key interrelated issues being citizenship, voting rights, and the nature and degree of existing legislative dis discrimination. So I'll make a comment about those three issues. Um, first of all, citizenship. In pragmatic terms, Excuse me, I'll simply state that the Constitution makes no formal reference to citizenship. And as others, including Hazlitt at the time, uh, made the point, Aborigines already had formal citizenship via the federal statute of the 1948 Nationality and Citizen Act, and which was supported by various state legislations. So citizenship was not a component of the 67 referendum. Voting rights. Aboriginal voting rights dated back to the 1850s and various state and federal legislation since that time, um, including in West Australia in, in 62 and in Queensland in 1965, have incorporated and supported Aboriginal franchise. Whilst I readily accept that owing to a number of significant socio-political factors, including social exclusion and discrimination, education standards, general, general ignorance, and misinformation about the political system, as well as the tyranny of distance affecting access to voting processes, many Aboriginal people either chose not to vote or were unaware of their eligibility to vote. But nevertheless, my paper clearly 
shows voting rights were not an issue for the 67 referendum. I want to make a comment about discriminatory legislation, and I need to be careful about how I, uh, uh, you know, uh, talk about this issue. With regard to this, um, both in both state and, state and federal spheres, by around 1965, most of the discriminatory laws had been repealed. By 1966, Aboriginals federally were entitled to pensions, maternity and unemployment benefits. Progressively, in 57 in Victoria, 63 in New South Wales, 66 in South Australia, state-based legislation were amended and repealed to remove the long-standing oppressive and discriminative, uh, discriminatory laws. So in so saying, I don't wish to ignore or dilute the harsh reality of oppression and discrimination still suffered by Aboriginal people even after various discriminatory legislations had been repealed. And I certainly wouldn't want to do that in the week where we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Bringing Them Home report, the national inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. Um, I would have more respect for the people affected by those policies to suggest that the uh, discriminatory nature of the state and control and influence of the state were anything but oppressive and stringent. However, in the confines of my lecture today, I'm simply attempting to show that the degree and influence of discriminatory laws, and I'm not talking about practice or social exclusion, simply the law, had positively shifted in the lead up to the 67 referendum. And although this situation did not appear to be acknowledged and certainly not promulgated by the 67 campaigners. And obviously the campaigners shaped and presented a case which was designed to appeal to a broader societal sense of social justice and fairness and in ways which were easily digested and understood and thus avoiding, of course, any need to articulate the specific details of the amendments and be involved in any complex legal interpretations. I want to make some comment now about the impact of the 67 referendum. And I have two aspects of this, the immediate and short-term impact and the longer-term impact. And I'm going to talk about the immediate and short-term impact. And to cut to the chase, I'll refer to a saying that my late father used to use quite often whenever he his expectations were not uh, met. And he used to say, they promised us the world and gave us an atlas. <laughs> that goes some way to expressing my view about the impact, the short-term impact of the referendum. From my personal perspective, um, uh, in my paper I'm saying from my personal perspective, however, nothing changed at all in our lives. When the outcome was announced, I can recall a number of family and Aboriginal friends acting rather celebratory about the outcome, including my own grandmother, who was a big fan of Faith Bandler. I personally wondered what all, if indeed any, of the fuss was about. Um, I certainly observed some uh, behaviours in the non-Indigenous community that suggested they were very pleased with the outcome. And I go, I, I try to address the reasons behind that in my paper. Um, but certainly it was a feeling of, uh, that there would certainly be more social justice um, considerations in terms of how Aboriginal people would be treated as a result of that very positive vote. So from my perspective, apart from some immediate feel-good behaviours, in the short term, the 67 referendum had very little impact whatsoever. And I have to say that my own personal views about the short-term impact are supported by history. Um, and I say in my paper that it was obvious that the federal government, sorry, similarly, it is obvious that the federal coalition governments involved in the immediate-term Holt administration and the successive longer-term McMahon and Gordon administration took very little, if any, action at all to alter the status quo and to assume control for Aboriginal affairs immediately after the 
67 referendum, despite the weight and the integrity of the overwhelming yes vote. Um, one of the heroes, Faith Bandler, expressed a similar view, and I'm quoting now from Faith's book. Changes following the referendum were disappointingly slow. Our earlier euphoria died down. The government, despite putting the referendum to the people, had themselves been lukewarm about it. This was evident not only from their pre-referendum posture, but also from the absence of any real plan of action on which they should embark following the referendum. Meanwhile, Faith says, the lives of Aboriginal, Aborigines virtually remain the same, still under state control. Can I also refer to the memoirs of Barry Dexter? Many here today would be aware that Barry was appointed one of the <coughs> three men appointed to uh, the Council of Aboriginal Affairs. Also, Barry was appointed as the Secretary of the Department at that time. Barry's uh, memoirs, entitled Pandora's Box, um, in terms of the five years following the referendum, describes the period of political and bureaucratic apathy and a paucity of empathy, understanding of and commitment to improving Indigenous lives. And I think the following quote from Barry Dexter summarises the view and my view also of the period, uh, the short term period following the referendum. And he talked about the optimism entailed in Prime Minister Holt supporting a referendum and establishing the Office of Aboriginal Affairs as well as the Council of Aboriginal Affairs. And he talks about this, that following the referendum, the, the firm support that Mr Holt had shown for handling the Commonwealth new responsibilities through the Council and the Office would, I reasoned, no doubt be continued by his governmental colleagues. How wrong I was, in emphasis. So from my own perspectives, supported by historical evidence, the short-term impact of the 1967, quite frankly, was negligible. I now want to talk about the longer-term impact, and it is completely different to my view about the short-term impact. I consider that the longer-term impact to be both positive and extremely profound. And my paper goes into some detail as to why I hold that view. And I'd urge you to read it when you get the opportunity. But I try to summarise it in this way. <coughs> Excuse my voice. I believe that the impact represents both a high point and a tipping point in the history of Australia as a result of, firstly, the unprecedented, unprecedented success in the landslide yes vote, the success in securing the Commonwealth Government involvement in Indigenous affairs and related positive influence in dismantling discriminatory laws and policies and the breaking down of the assimilation policy. Also, contribution of the referendum outcome to the improvement of the nation's capacity to better recognise and understand the scope and size of the Indigenous population and the degree of disadvantage suffered by Indigenous Australians. That is, of course, through the work of the Census. And therefore, of course, to design strategies to address such disadvantage. I also believe the impact was profound because of the beneficial impact on the nature of the relationships between Indigenous Australians governments and mainstream Australia. Also, I think it contributed to a positive influence in the acceptance and recognition of Indigenous Australians as a re resilient, culturally rich and unique First Nations peoples. And finally, the unifying and mobilising effect on Indigenous Australians. And I go into some length in the paper about, you know, the yes vote was a catalyst for further advocacy and actions by various individuals and collectives. I want to talk about one further aspect of the uh, referendum that's quite dear to my thinking, I've got to say. And I have that feeling now, and I had it when I was 19 years old, age in 1964. And I refer to it as a parody of esteem. Um, I, strongly, I feel strongly that in addition to the issues of equality and equity sought by Indigenous Australians, 
and the associated quest to close the gap in various elements of our health, education and other socio-economic indicators. There is another important aspirational objective shared uh, by Indigenous Australians. I'll refer to this as a parody of esteem. Noel Pearson refers to this, and I quote Noel, and this is what Noel had to say about this issue, that there is a basic democratic problem in our country. Unless this notion Sorry, unless this nation continues to harbour that old pseudo-scientific belief in the inferiority, inferiority of its Indigenous people, for some a matter of romantic tragedy and for others an unsentimentally bru tru bru brutal truth, then there is something wrong with the nation as a whole rather than with the parlous minority. So in referring to the parity of esteem, I refer to the reaching of a point in time whereby Indigenous Australians and our identities, our cultures, our language, our history, and our digni dignity as resilient peoples are afforded the same degree of respect as other cultures. And mainly in the Australian con context, I'm talking about Western cultures. As Indigenous Australians, as the most resilient cultural group on the planet, we are tired of being too often referred to treated and considered as peoples whose cultures, language, beliefs and histories are somehow inferior or secondary to others. We seek greater acknowledgement and respect for who we are and our place in the nation and the world. And I'll make the point that I believe that despite the claims for a better world articulated by the successful 67 referendum campaigners and despite other positives, we did not go anywhere near achieving a parity of esteem at the time. And I, in my paper, I tried to justify my view. Brings me to Indigenous constitutional recognition. What does it mean? <coughs> I need to record that Indigenous constitutional recognition to me refers to having embedded in our constitution both symbolic and substantive content which acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, acknowledge and values the richness and diversity of our culture and provides permanent safeguards that we have a role in decision making and we will be treated fairly. There is almost universal acceptance that the original constitution, supposedly the founding document of the nation, was drafted with a complete absence of any Indigenous consideration whatsoever, save some elements of discrimination and exclusion. So if we concur that the Constitution is truly the foundation document of Australia, provides a structural basis for our system of government and somehow reflects our values as a nation, then I believe as Australians we must support the need for amendment. As Professor George Williams, and I'm quoting George here, has suggested, it is time to fix the silence at the heart of Australia's Constitution. So there remains some important unfinished constitutional business we need to be conducted. This brings me to contemporary challenges. And I wish to acknowledge as we speak <clears throat> that a national referendum in Uluru comes to a close today. This event culminates uh, uh, the hosting of 12 Indigenous dialogues around the country and is of course attempting to determine the preferred position from an Indigenous perspective about what constitutional amendments might look like. And of course, this is entirely appropriate given that as in Indigenous constitutional recognition is about us, Indigenous Australians, then it's entirely fitting and proper that our views have primacy in deciding the nature and form of any constitutional amendments. Um, from a broader perspective, the, the Indigenous National Convention has as its guiding template some work from a couple of um, important platforms. And that is the um, 2012 report of the expert panel and the 2015 final report of the Australian Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition. It also can draw from its own, sorry, the Indigenous National Convention can also draw from the Referendum Council's own 2016 discussion paper. 
I make the point that both the Joint Select Committee and the Expert Panel have indicated that there is strong support for Indigenous constitutional recognition. And this, of course, has been confirmed by surveys conducted by Recognise in its campaign. And both the committees that I refer to have opted for a range or package of amendments rather than any single amendment to the Constitution. And very briefly, although my paper goes into it more in more detail, the template for change suggests drafting a statement acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians, amending or deleting the race power in section 5126, inserting a constitutional prohibition against racial discrimination, <coughs> providing an Indigenous voice to be heard in Parliament and the right to be consulted on legislation and policy, and finally, deleting section 25, which talks about, of course, excluding some Australians from voting on the basis of their race. And my paper goes into some details about those amendments. However, as the saying goes, the devil's always in the detail. And it goes without saying that not only do we need to concern ourselves with the details of the content, but we also have to have regard to the processes used in referenda. And of course, an obvious fundamental concern here today is the double majority. Um, that is a majority of votes and a majority of states. And I believe in this day and age that represents a bit of a challenge in terms of whatever the constitutional amendments that come out of Uluru and whatever the constitutional amendments ultimately are negotiated by the Referendum Council and by government. Uh, I just, in terms of the double dissolution, I quote Patrick Dodson. History shows that Australians tend to be cautious when it comes to changing the constitution, particularly if the proposition put to the voting public is not well understood. I think Patrick's words uh, absolutely apply in today's debates around Indigenous constitutional recognition. Uh, also, can I just, uh, by way of um, qualification, the expert panel identified four principles. That is that the, whatever the proposals might be, they need to contribute to a more unified and reconciled nation. They need to be benefit, of benefit to and accord with the wishes of Indigenous Australians. They need to be capable of being supported by the overwhelming majority of Australians from across the political and social spectrum. And finally, they need to be technically and legally sound. Now, they also echoed a bit of a caution in the context of a failed referendum. For many Australians, and I'm quoting now from their report, the failure of a referendum on recognition uh, would result in confusion about the nation's values, commitment to racial non-discrimination and sense of national identity. The negative impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people would be profound. I made the point, in my view, the impact would have a much more profound effect on, not on the minority Indigenous population, but on Australia as a nation. And I'll make a point about that later. Also, um, the expert panel had other things to say about the conditions uh, by which a referendum might be successful. <coughs> and that are whether there is strong support for proposals to be put at a referendum across the political spectrum. Whether the referendum proposals are likely to be vigorously opposed by significant groups. The likelihood of opposition to the referendum proposal from one or more state governments. Whether the government has done all it can to lay the groundwork for public support. Whether there would be sufficient time to build public awareness. Whether the referendum would be conducted in a political environment conducive to sympathetic consideration. And whether the referendum would be seen by electors as genuine and meaningful uh, to avoid various things, including elements of being tokenistic. Um, so those conditions all apply in today's challenge. And in my paper, I've actually gone uh, and quoted some quotes from people who have been involved in the Indigenous dialogues including Pat Anderson, the co-chair of the Referendum Council, who's been leading the dialogues, 
uh, along with also with Professor Megan Davis, who's also a member of the Referendum Council and has been heavily involved in all of the dialogues. And I've also heard a quote from one of the leaders who attended the dialogues. Time won't permit me to go through those quotes, but can I just say, it is clear that Aboriginal folk attending those dialogues are advocating substantive constitutional amendment. My paper makes a brief mention, by the way, of treaties. And I don't intend to spend a lot of time on it today, but I think it's appropriate that that issue of treaty and sovereignty um, you know, be raised in the context of constitutional uh, recognition. However, for the point of view of my lecture today, I just place on record my view that constitutional reform and the establishment of a treaty or a package of treaties um, between the Commonwealth Government and Indigenous Australia are both worthwhile aspirations. I believe that there's considerable value and benefit to the nation in currently pursuing and securing both meaningful constitutional change and the establishment of agreement making in the form of a treaty in order to address unresolved issues of sovereignty and historical grievances. So um, that's my small but succinct take on the issue of a treaty. I know that our leaders have suggested that the issue of a treaty might restrain or somehow limit the discussions of constitutional change. And I think they've assigned it to a time in the future where we might be able to address that. I have a different view on that and I say so in the paper. So to conclude, can I just say that what's, we are going to have some tensions between what I anticipate to be substantive reforms coming out of the Indigenous dialogues and what the government and other um, players might think is acceptable and doable in the context of a, con of a referendum. And I articulate that in my paper in more length than I'm going to be able to do this morning, uh, this afternoon. Um, and I talk about challenges, and if I have time, I'd like to just go through those. Um, I talk about, sorry, in terms of those challenges, we have a potential convergence or perhaps confrontation of a package involving substantive Indigenous reform, assuming such is supported by the Referendum Council um, and their recommendation to government. So it's substantive Indigenous reform versus conservative positions on what the government and others might support. So, so without, excuse me, without specific knowledge of the Indigenous preferred position coming out of Uluru, and to reflect my own Indigenous perspective on the challenges facing the country, I record the following personal thoughts. I believe the chances of securing strong support for the proposal to be put at the referendum across, across the political spectrum will be extremely challenging. I hold this view in the context of the current political environment and the machinations of our major parties, our minor parties and independents, and their respective propensity for adversarial and oppositional positions and behaviours. I also note the emergence of xenophobic positions and the re-emergence of the fear and loathing of racial and cultural difference prominently playing out in the political and public discourse, both domestically and internationally. My next point is, similarly, I, do, I have concerns about any, referendum, sorry, any referendum uh, being conducted in a political environment conducive to sympathetic consideration by the electorate. I think it's highly likely that any proposal will be vigorously opposed by significant and influential groups. And as I've said previously, and possibly even one or more state government. Unlike 1967, as I mentioned before, I think there will be a strong no case. And I understand that actually that it may be funded by government in their, view, in their wish to be seen as honest brokers in the process. Although I think, I understand that uh, Mr Shorten has come out and suggested he would not support funding of a no case. Uh, but up until recently, I understood that there was going to be government funding available to the no case. So certainly that's going to have an influence on the likely success or otherwise of any referendum. 
Um, my view is the, the more detail and substantive the constitutional change advocated by Indigenous interests, the stronger the opposition. Uh, I think much more needs to be done and undoubtedly more time is needed to create public awareness, public awareness before Australians can all hold our hands on our hearts and be satisfied that the government has done all it can to lay, lay the groundwork for effective public engagement and support or otherwise for any referendum. Uh, and I also believe there's considerable risk that any referendum proposals may be seen by electors as genuine and meaningful. And my comment here really goes more to the Indigenous interests about whether you know, these things may be considered to be tokenistic. I have some other misgivings that I'd like to share with you. And I strongly believe that most Indigenous Australians support both symbolic and substantive reform and that they will resoundingly reject any referendum that is only symbolic, cosmetic or minimalistic in nature. If any substantive reforms are rejected or seriously diluted or compromised by government, then in my view, the Indigenous leadership supported by the Indigenous electorate will simply walk away. From an Indigenous perspective, constitutional recognition will take as long as it takes and that the time frame will not be hijacked or unduly influenced by the political convenience or expedience and agendas of others. I believe that Indigenous constitutional recognition should not be achieved at any price. And by that, I'm deeply concerned that any upcoming public, social or political airing of the arguments for and against, there's a real threat to our social cohesion. And with this in mind, I make the following points. I'm coming to an end, Tim. <laughs> My I view the public debate around any proposed Indigenous constitutional recognition needs to be absolutely respectful by all involved. All campaigners and advocates need to be fully aware of the sensitivities in any arguments and the potential for hurtful and divisive impact and fallout. The risk in causing any immediate or longer term damage to, to social cohesion and unity needs to be anticipated and avoided by ill-considered public statements and positions. Racism and cultural denigration will divide us and will deter or even destroy any real or potentially beneficial engagement. Put simply, I seek to protect my family, my children, my grandchildren from being harmed or being denigrated and or dismissed as second class citizens, second class Australians, because of some misguided, uninformed or racist contribution to the debate. We claim to uphold the values of a democratic country and in doing so, surely in such an important public discourse, we can display all the respectful qualities of a true, truly civil society. This is certainly my fervent hope. Um, together with these misgivings, can I just reiterate a point I made earlier, that in dealing um, that an unsuccessful referendum would deal a tremendous blow to Australia's international standing as a modern nation which values its reputation for liberal thinking, equality and human rights. And I make the point that Indigenous Australians do think about, respect and cherish our reputation, the reputation of our country internationally. This is not the exclusive province of non-Indigenous Australia. Mind you, as Indigenous Australians, we approach these matters from a different cultural and historic paradigm and experience. Um, and to a very large degree, that is what um, the concept of Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, this is what it's all about. It's about recognition and respect for our existence and history before and since 1770 and the resilience of our peoples and our cultures as first Australians within a modern multicultural nation made up of and shared by more recently arrived other Australians. <coughs> the indelible global blemish on the Australian nation created as a result of an unsuccessful 
referendum outcome would last for a very long time indeed. Given the time frame required to achieve any redress, and of course which would require revisiting the same constitutional processes that we're now talking about engaging with. I repeat my view that such an outcome would speak much more harshly about the broader Australian nation than it would about its minority Indigenous population. So to conclude, uh, I'd like to revisit the issue of parity of esteem that I raised earlier in the, in the lecture. And I voiced some strong reservations and concerns about the challenge involved with Indigenous constitutional recognition. However, I'd like to really em emphasise I nevertheless remain optimistic in the firm belief that Indigenous constitutional recognition is an honourable aspiration for all Australians and that it is achievable and, of course, in my view, well overdue. However, I hope that whatever the proposals may be and however we may conduct the debates, we could together as a nation achieve some significant progress towards achieving the elusive parity of esteem about which I have spoken. If we were to do this through stronger mutual regard and respect for each other, I've no doubt that Australia would be a better country and that all our lives and life choices and those of our children and their children would be greatly enhanced and much more rewarding and fulfilling. In so saying, I believe, and I'm quoting now, that the wonderful achievement of collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians referred to by Megan Davis and Marcia Langton in their publication, um, could be revisited and repeated at some time in the very near future. Yalu Maria Maru Yanganalda. Thank you very much. Go well. Be safe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Russell. Before we take questions from the floor, I'd like to ask Dennis Strangman to speak briefly to his paper on the Nexus question. Dennis was an advisor to Senator Vince Gare, the parliamentary leader of the Australian Democratic Labor Party, who was also a strong advocate of a no vote on the Nexus question. So for the next five or so minutes, Dennis will take us through some of the ideas in his paper. Dennis Strangman. Thanks very much, Tim. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. These days, when I ask people about the Nexus referendum, they either say they do not recall the detail or it was before their time. I was in my 20s when it took place and I had a front seat. The period was 1965-67 when it was first proposed, postponed for a year, and eventually held in 1967. With the assistance of files which I had retained from my involvement and a more recent examination of the available Archives Office files, I have been able to look at both sides of the Nexus campaign during this period. The result is the outline made available to you today and collectible up there at the front. I would like to make 10 brief assertions about the campaign, its origins and result based on this research. First, I believe that the Nexus question, which Tim has explained already, which sought to remove section 24 of the constitution, which stipulates that the number of MHRs shall be, quote, as nearly as practicable, twice the number of senators, unquote, was seen by the government of the day as a way primarily of avoiding a loss of Liberal and country party seats predicted to occur if a redistribution was held under the then size of the House of Representatives. To the Liberals and the ALP, breaking the nexus also had the added bonus of not lowering the quota for election to the Senate and thereby avoiding the presence of any more troublesome DLP or independent senators. Second, the Aboriginal question, I believe, was included with the Nexus question 
in the hope that the electorate's good feelings towards Aborigines and the anticipated high yes vote would flow over into a strong yes vote on the less popular nexus question. Third, a major reason for the failure of the nexus question was that the rank and file and the members of parliament of the Liberal country parties and the ALP, despite the protestations of their leaders that they were fully supportive of the proposal, ran dead in the campaign. It indicated that a nominal bipartisan support is no guarantee of success in a constitutional referendum, nor for that matter is a proposal that originates from a joint parliamentary committee. And with respect to Russell, I need to add even an expert committee. Uh, by the way, Russell's presentation before me was tremendous, and I'm, going, I'm one who's going to look forward to reading the full paper in the Papers on Parliament series later on. My fourth assertion is that the result achieved what its supporters set out to achieve, i.e. no more politicians. By delaying an increase in the size of the House of Representatives and the Senate for 17 years. Fifth, the referendum saw the partisan involvement of senior public servants in drafting and advising about the government's yes case in a manner which I believe exceeded their proper role. Sixth, the result prompted a senior electoral office person to intervene in a manner which cast doubt on any suggestion that the Electoral Commission would be a suitable impartial body to draft the yes and no cases in any future referendums or plebiscites, a role I am pleased to say the Australian Electoral Commission has rejected. Seventh, from 7th of April 1965, when Cabinet first decide, decided to hold the two referendums, until 20th of January 1966, when Sir Robert Menzies retired, the Nexus proposal represented a gamble that had the potential to waste a lot of political capital held by the government. This must have been apparent with the Gallup poll result in May 1965, which showed that the proposal had only 33% support among voters. There is no evidence in the files or writings that the prospect of an unpopular referendum directly hastened Sir Robert's retirement, but the anticipated effort required to achieve a yes vote must have been a concern. His daughter, Heather Henderson, said in Canberra three weeks ago, quote, we all felt it was probably time he retired, and he had been thinking about it, retirement, for a while. Was the prospect of a political defeat on the nexus the straw that broke the Prime Minister's back? Eighth, I believe the campaign and the result, when it was eventually held under Mr Holt's Prime Ministership on the 27th of May 1967, was an endorsement of the emerging independence of the Senate. In 1968, political scientist Henry Mayer identified mid-1965 as the start of the change in the Senate from a stagnant backwater to a rebellious chamber. In 1967, the then Deputy Clerk of the Senate, Mr Roy Bullock, in an article about the referendum, wrote, quote, the year 1967 was one of the most remarkable years in 67 years of the Australian Senate's history. He was referring to occasions when the government was defeated in one way or another, which commenced in 1965 with a more evenly balanced and representative Senate. It would be a brave Prime Minister today who sought to tread this path again of seeking to diminish the role of the Senate. Ninth, indecisiveness by the Yes advocates about the size of the increase in the House of Representatives that they sought enabled the no advocates to choose their own figure of 24 extra members of the House of Representatives and frame the debate accordingly. This increase proved to be correct 17 years later with the nexus still intact. Tenth and finally, the claim by the yes proponents that the Senate would be in perpetual deadlock, 
if the nexus was retained and the Senate was increased to 72 or thereabouts, and it is now 76 with the two sets of territory senators, as happened in 1984, has proved not to be the case in the past 33 years. There are other historically interesting features of the story contained in the research document you have. On the whole, there has been a lack of studies of past referendums. I hope that this paper has filled some of the gaps. Thank you. And that gives us a little time for questions. Uh, there are a couple of microphones either side uh, of the theatre, but we've also got people who can uh, bring them to you because this theatre is not the easiest thing to get around. Um, so, would anybody, uh, has anybody got a question to start off with? And if there's somebody at the back, I probably can't see because I'm staring straight into a, a spotlight there. Ah, yes, at the back there, the microphone's coming around now. My question, my question to both of you is a simple one. Would you not agree that the result of the referendum in 1967 was a classic case of the Australian people taking the bait but not the hook? To you, Russell. <laughs> There's always the option to take things as a comment, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'll do the... Uh, Tony Jones will take this comment. Oh, I'm not quite sure... I mean, I think certainly, from an Indigenous perspective, the issues and questions that, and, and the outcome of the 67 referendum certainly left a lot of unfinished business and unanswered questions from an Indigenous perspective. And I, I've already mentioned in my lecture that I do think there was a certain amount of um, uh, misguided or uh, either deliberate or otherwise to what the actual referendum question and the outcome was all about. Um, but as I say, I think the campaigners in this being driven by a strong sense of social justice, um, put a case to the Australian people that simplified and if you like, facilitated a positive outcome. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean about the bait and the hook, but, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but uh, I do believe that even now we heard, I heard something two days ago where somebody who was, yeah, sorry, that, the bait. sorry? The bait was the Aboriginal question which would be carried. The hook was the first question. Oh, I see, okay. Which the politicians hoped would be carried because the politician hoped the people would take both the bait and the hook. And the yes. major motive for the having a referendum at all was the very first question. But the Australian yeah. people, as they quite often do, they took the bait and they refused to take the hook. I think, well, I think that's absolutely the case. Yeah. Could I ask Mr. McCarris, our well-known cephologist, and Malcolm, nice to see you here. Um, what, uh, having heard Russell's uh, earlier presentation and the qualifications that he made about the prospects of a constitutional amendment uh, today in relation to Aboriginal rights and recognition, what is your guess uh, as an experienced political observer as to how that might fare today? Well, my guess is what will happen is that there won't ever be a referendum for the simple reason that the Aboriginal leadership will make demands which would be described as um, making the perfect the enemy of the good. But eventually there will be a declaration of Aboriginal uh, occupation of Australia which would be made separate from a referendum, but it would, to some extent, help the Aborigines to have an official declaration to that effect as distinct from people simply saying so. OK, I think there's opportunity for one more question here, and perhaps this will be the last question after that. Thank you. My question is addressed to Russell Taylor. You have emphasised how demoralising it would be for Aboriginal people if a referendum were lost. And that, of course, takes one immediately to how wide should the referendum be? What should be the content? Should be, it be formal? Should it be substantive? 
Now, the formal part, I guess, would be recognition of Indigenous people as the first Australians, maybe going a little bit further into recognition of our Aboriginal culture, although that in itself may have some legal impact. Yep. You then went on to advocate an opportunity for Indigenous people to have a voice and, to be, and a right to be consulted. That obviously leads itself to distortion in a no campaign. My question to you is, what are the considerations for you in determining whether to risk loss through including substantive provisions or whether to keep it to a minimum to enhance the prospects of success? Thank you, Ernst. I, I, my response is that I, even though I, clearly the Aboriginal people that have been involved in the dialogues and in the uh, current convention that's happening at Uluru have certainly been advocating substantive reform. Um, but I do think that the leadership would try to consider at the same time, not just the legitimacy of those substantive amendments, but also the issue that, of course, we're all concerned about, about what is doable or possible within a referendum. Um, my answer is that uh, I think the Indigenous leadership will have regard to what's doable and may be prepared to compromise on certain elements of the substantive amendments. But I still believe that even whatever's left after they do that and they consider that compromise will still of itself be substantive. I hope I'm answering your question, Ernst. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Martin Lindsley. Found your talk very, very informative, raised lots of questions. At the end, I think I missed it, but can you just quickly tell us what the wording that people agreed to back in 1967? It must have been a simple question, and I think uh, the Australian public likes simple questions. Have you got the wording that they said yes to, please? Um, I don't know that I... Got other than the, the first element was the removal of the words other than Aboriginal people, and then the second bit, which the other section was completely amended. But are you asking about the wording of the actual referendum question? I'm sorry, I don't have that. I didn't bring that with me. Have you got it? Dennis is going to come to the rescue here. This is the All advantage right. of being a hoarder. Uh, <laughs> which my family have tolerated for 60 or 74 years. Um, this is a copy of the pamphlet that was set out, sent out to all electors in 1967. And I might say I also have a copy of the pamphlet that was uh, distributed in night, or that was printed in 1966, but never distributed. The question was simply this, um, on the Aborigines, do you approve the proposed law for the alteration of the Constitution entitled an act to alter the Constitution so as to omit certain words relating to the people of the Aboriginal race in any state and so that Aboriginals are to be counted in reckoning the population. And I think that means we've run out of time now. <laughs> um, could you please thank Russell and Dennis for two stimulating presentations. Uh, that brings things to a conclusion and just a reminder that if you want to discuss some of these issues the ACT chapter of the ASPG is meeting or some people are meeting in the Queen's Terrace Cafe uh, immediately afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>